Well, good morning and welcome to Sunday Praise. I want to go out and have a so to see you all here this morning. Uh, today's service is a service of Holy Communion of the Lord's Supper. So, if you love the Lord, you can be baptized and like to receive the bread and wine, you're most welcome to do so. If not, please come forward for what you're going to do. And that will be at the end of the service, and the children will be coming back to the time after service. We're going to start with a word of greeting on the screen. And I'll leave you next to So let's, let's stand and greet one another in the name of God. Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you and your Savior with you. So just a few notices before we begin our worship. Um, firstly, to say that um, if you haven't yet seen the October appeal, please do respond to that as a letter of fact. We've raised almost three and a half thousand pounds towards the uh, garden office pod, which we hope is going to be installed on the 1st of November. Um, so by the 7th of November, we should have that space to be fantastic. Um, um, with our monthly theme for uh, prayer, and giving this month is uh, the Exeter Choices Crisis Pregnancy Centre. 
And uh, there is, if you put the cash in the bowl as you leave, um, that's where it goes. And we'll be friends with that as well. Um, if you're available at six o'clock tonight, we're going to be taking down the market. Um, Sterling said it was sunny, but we want it to be in good condition for next summer. So we're going to get it down there. It's now tea at six o'clock. And next summer, this service is all in worship. So it's going to be something like that. It will be a nice short service. And it's also going to be a service of baptism for three local families. So I hope you'll come on and support them and celebrate their vows. And finally, this is which I was going to make. You can ask the house is still a few uh, real advent calendars with a Christian message and fair trade chocolate inside it, which is more compelling. Um, but if you want one, see how it's another one. And the rest of those who are going to share. So let's uh, stand and go to the leaders of the worship. Good morning. Hope we're all well. Hope we've got a speaking voice for this. Uh, let's uh, join together in the question. Oh, 
We pray for our next door neighbors. Lord Jesus, help us to love them and for them to know how much they love them. We pray for our church family. Lord Jesus, help us to love them and for them to know how much we love them. We pray for our friends. Lord Jesus, help us to love them and for them to know how much we love them. We pray for those who find it hard to be grateful. Lord Jesus, help us to love them and for them to know how much we love them. We pray for those who meet in the shops, drive in the park, who we do not know. Lord Jesus, help us to love them and for them to know how much we love them. We pray for people who are poor in our country. Lord Jesus, help us to love them and for them to know how much we love them. We pray for people who are poor in other countries. Lord Jesus, help us to love them and for them to know how much we love them. We pray for people we know who are sad. Lord Jesus, help us to love them and for them to know how much we love them. We pray for people who are lonely. Lord Jesus, help us to love them and for them to know how much we love them. We pray for people we know who are unwell. Lord Jesus, help us to love them and for them to know how much we love them. Thank you for loving us and for hearing all these prayers. Amen. We're going to sing our family action song now, and it's like Jack's coming out to lead us. And uh, we, we learned this about a year ago, but it may have slipped to your mind. We've got video and Jack and his interesting actions. We are the church, so let's uh, start. Okay, we've got some actions to this. So um, uh, you may remember them from the last time we sang them. Um, we'll just do the action for the chorus because uh, I think we, the whole song will be a bit complicated. But it goes like this um, We are the church, have you heard? God, what, he washed us clean with his word. He chose us to be on his team. We are more loved than we dream. We've got good news, shout it out. You've got to hear what it's all about. Um, <laughs> no one's too far away to be welcomed into God's family. Um, so let's give that a go. It's, it's a song all about uh, us uh, being big and being part of God's family. How wonderful it is. So hopefully, we'll be seeing it. <laughs> Before the world began, God made a master plan to bring all things together under one head. That head is Jesus Christ, who died on cross for life, and now he's seated at the right hand of God. Once we were dead in sin, now we are mixed with him. By grace we're saved and faith in Jesus Christ. He does his work, he unites it by his hand. We are the church, and we want to be what we must be. With this word, you chose us to be our seed. We are more loved than we could be. We got good news, shout it out. You got to be what it's all about. No one's too far away to be. Seeking the truth in love, to build the body up. We serve each other using this kind of thing. We pray for unity, so everyone will see. Was not in action in his people today. We are the church, and humanity prospers me. With his word, he chose. 
explaining and proving that the Christ had to suffer and rise from the dead. This Jesus I am proclaiming to you is the Christ, he said. Some of the Jews were persuaded and joined for the silence, as did a large number of God-fearing Greeks, and not a few prominent women. But the Jews were jealous, so they rounded up some bad characters from the marketplace, formed a mob, and started a riot in the city. They rushed to Jason's house in search of Paul and Silas in order to bring them out to the crowd. But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some other brothers before the city officials, shouting, These men, who have caused trouble all over the world, have now come here. And Jason has welcomed them into his house. They are all defying Caesar's decrees, saying that there is another king, one called Jesus. When they heard this, the crowd and the city officials were thrown into turmoil. Then they took Jason and the others on bail and let them go. As soon as it was night, the brothers sent Paul and Silas away to Berea. On arriving there, they went to the Jewish synagogue. Now the Bereans were a more noble character than the Thessalonians, for they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. Many of the Jews believed, as also a number of prominent Greek women and many Greek men. When the Jews in Thessalonica learned that Paul was preaching the word of God at Berea, they went there too, agitating the crowd and stirring them up. The brothers immediately sent Paul to the coast, but Silas and Timothy stayed at Berea. The men who escorted Paul brought him to Athens and then left, with instructions for Silas and Timothy to join him. As soon as possible. And the second reading is taken from the first chapter of Letter of Thessalonians. It's found on 1186 in the Church Bibles. First chapter, first Thessalonians, 1186. Paul, Silas, and Timothy to the Church of the Thessalonians. In God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace and peace to you. We always thank God for all of you, mentioning you in our prayers. We continually remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labour prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers loved by God, that he has chosen you because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit, and with deep conviction. You know how we lived among you for your sake. You became imitators of us and of the Lord. In spite of severe suffering, you welcomed the message with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. And so you became a model to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. The Lord's message ran out from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, your faith in God has become known everywhere. Therefore, we do not need to say anything about it, for they themselves report what kind of reception you gave us. They tell how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his Son from heaven, who will be raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Thank you, Alison. Please do uh, keep that final passage open if you need it. Page 1186. And let's pray. Father, we thank you for your work in Scripture. And we pray that by the power of your Holy Spirit, you will open our eyes to know with confidence that you are our Father and that your Son Jesus is our Savior. In his name we pray. Amen. I wonder how often you write a letter you know, with an actual pen and a piece of paper. I'm sure we send texts and WhatsApp messages and emails all day long, and I like it. But get a pen out, that's unusual. And it may be we've forgotten some of the conventions that go with it. How are you supposed to write it? You put the address and the date at the top. Dear someone, and then yours sincerely or faithfully or with love or, or what at the bottom. And how do you, what do you want? What are you supposed to say? Dear, when I write my weekly email, I write, Dear friends, but it looks a bit quaint. Should I write, Ladies and gentlemen, that sounds far too pompous, or Dear brothers and sisters, but that sounds a bit sort of cultish, um, or Hi guys, and that's far too shabby. What are you supposed to do? We need rules. Well, today we're looking at Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians. And it's not only Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians. We think it's the first letter he wrote, but we've got, in fact, it's likely to be the first thing written of the New Testament as we now have it. You heard the story, Alison read it, and that useful map showed you how Paul was persecuted in Philippi as a Philippi jailer, then fled to Thessalonica where he was persecuted and driven out by a mob, and then to Berea and then to Athens. And in the next bit after Athens, Paul goes to Corinth. And while Paul was in Athens, he was getting so worried about the Thessalonians, he sent Timothy back to Thessalonica to find out how they were doing. And then Timothy comes back to find Paul, who is now moved to Corinth. And so Paul writes this letter with Timothy and Silvanius from Corinth, and we can date that to about 50 AD. That means within 17 to 20 years of the crucifixion. Christianity is brand new. So how do you write an official letter from an apostle to a church? It's never been done before. Greeks would start the letter, greetings. Would you read this cabin or caris? Jews would say, peace be with you. So Paul puts his words together and comes up with Paul to the church of the Thessalonians, grace to you and peace. Even the first words are full of the gospel. But why does Paul write a letter? He doesn't have the option of email or WhatsApp, but why is he writing it? And I think he's writing it to encourage these new Christians in their faith. As we'll see in the weeks to come as we run through this little series, he wants to assure them that he does care about them and that he hasn't abandoned them just after birth, as it were. His teaching of them had been interrupted by persecution, so he wants to complete the instruction he began. And we'll learn more about the second coming in, in later in the chapter. He wants them to he wants to prepare them to endure suffering. And we'll learn more about that in the weeks to come. But this week I want to focus on this first chapter where Paul, I think, wants to assure them that their faith, new and fragile it is, is genuine, that God has been working. Look at chapter 1, verse 4. We know, brothers loved by God, that he has chosen you, because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit, and with deep conviction. We know that God has chosen you. And that's so important. Now, how can we know that something is genuine? Because there's lots of fake stuff out there. Give that picture. You can find shops like this over here. <laughs> genuine fake watches. As opposed to what? How do we know that something we buy in a shop is the genuine article? Well, it may have the logo on it. 
uh, the Apple symbol or the Microsoft brand or whatever it may be. Its price tag is a clue. It's going really cheap. It's probably not the real thing. And the ad that you buy it from is very important. We're fairly confident. You go into a proper shop in the UK, what do you get is the real thing. Go to a car boot sale or a street market, well, you take the chances, don't you? But what are these shops overseas selling? What do they mean it's a genuine fake? Probably what it means it's a good quality fake. Yeah, of course it's fake, but it's a good one. Is that what it means? And the question that's troubling the Thessalonians, I think, is we've just heard about this Jesus, and then I'm getting the picture now. Um, and then Paul's gone. What have we got? Is it real? Can it be true? And Paul wants to assure them that their faith is genuine and real. And we can be assured that God has chosen us. And we'll see three clues. When our hearts are convicted, when our lives are changed, and when others confirm by their witness. Hearts convicted, lives changed, witnesses confirm. So let's start with convicted hearts. Genuine faith must begin by hearing and believing the gospel, the truth that Jesus died for our sins, that he rose again by the power of God and he lives and reigns. That is the essence of faith, and it comes by hearing and believing. It doesn't come because we're more moral and good or more clever than other people. It comes to us because by the power of the Spirit, we are given faith. And so Paul says, we know God has chosen you because our gospel came to you not simply with what it said that's essential, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit, and with deep conviction. Deep conviction that I'm a sinner and Jesus is a savior. And it's fascinating to look at this epistle and find out just how much Paul must have taught them. Then he takes the granted, and he starts his letter to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. As we thought last week, to call God Father is not natural. It's an amazing privilege given us to us through Jesus. So Paul assumes that these, these new Christians know that God is their Father. And the reason they can call their Father is because Jesus has served them. And this Jesus he calls Lord. And that's not just a polite title. Every Jew, every day, would recite the Shema, Deuteronomy 6 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. So to say that Jesus is Lord, and at the same time to say that God is Father, will you understand two gods? No, it's Paul, there's one God. God is Father, and Jesus is Lord. So how can these two be one? Well, that's the mystery of the Trinity. And Thessalonians doesn't explain it. But the, and it took the church centuries to formulate it. But here, in the very first letter, is a clear evidence that this is what they believed that Jesus was God. Not only that, but Paul goes on to speak, verse uh, 3. We continue to remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labor produced by love, and your endurance inspired by. Faith, love, hope, the three theological virtues. What faith looks like, both present and future. We believe in God. Because we believe in what God has done for us, we love God with all our hearts, and we hope in God, who's going to return in glory and raise us from the dead. Faith, hope, and love imply a whole doctrine of Christian understanding. And did Paul manage to teach this all on three Sabbaths in the synagogue? I mean, Paul was good, but I'm not sure he was that good. And you read Luke and you think it's three weeks and then Paul was out. It's likely, actually, that Paul stayed, was thrown out of the synagogue after three weeks, but it took the Jews a while to get them all together. So he may have been there for weeks, if not months. And certainly, we know that the Philippians managed to send him two gifts in that time. So Paul managed a lot of instruction. But then he was driven out before it was finished. Paul knows that their faith is genuine, but faith that's just in the head is not sufficient. There needs to be fruit growing from the roots. So, as well as convicted hearts, we need to look at changed lives. 
And Paul was worried about the Thessalonians, so he sent Timothy off from Berea to the back. And then Timothy comes back when Paul's in uh, Corinth and says, Paul, good news, they're standing firm, their faith is real. And that's why Paul can say, we always remember you in our prayers. We continue remembering your work produced by faith, your labour prompted by love, and your endurance produced by hope. You see how faith, hope, and love produce work, labour, endurance, changed lives. And Paul doesn't explain what he's, exactly what he's talking about, but we can guess that their lives were beginning to change under the influence of the gospel. Perhaps at work, the slaves were more cheerful and hardworking, the businesses were more honest and uh, showed more integrity. At home, husbands and wives were treating each other with a, a new courtesy. Children may even obey their parents, and parents may be gentle with their children as never before. The gospel was doing its amazing work. But most remarkable of all the things that Paul has noticed and Timothy has reported, verse 6, is this. You became imitators of us and of the Lord in spite of severe suffering. In other words, not only did they love and work, but they endured severe persecution. It wasn't just Paul was persecuted, it was the Thessalonians themselves. <laughs> They were imitators of Paul. They knew what Christian faith involved. They saw what happened to Paul. They heard what had happened to the Lord Jesus in Jerusalem and been crucified, and they knew this is what was involved in Christian faith. To be a Christian in the first centuries of the church was going to be costly. You might be accused of political treason. The mob of Thessalonians said, these men are calling us to worship another king than Caesar. That's treason. You might be accused of atheism, and other Christians often were. These men are not worshipping our idols anymore, so our crops will fail, our businesses won't grow. That means atheism was not only believing one God. And they were accused of immorality. So the secretive services in which they attended were rumoured to be not love feasts, happy feasts, but orgies, who knows what they get up to up there. See, to be a Christian in the first century was not respectful. It was thoroughly unrespectable. And yet, these Thessalonians endured it. And they endured it not just with gritted teeth, but Paul says, in spite of severe suffering, he welcomed the message with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. And this is just what Jesus said in the Beatitudes. Do you remember it? I'll just have to turn to it. Blessed are you, Matthew 5 12. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way, they persecuted the prophets that were before you. Their lives are changed at home, at work, and in facing persecution. Will we endure if Christianity becomes despised and illegal? But Paul says, as well as what I see in your hearts and in your lives, there are other witnesses as well. Can we actually be sure that we're Christians? Can we know that God has chosen us? Isn't that incredibly arrogant a claim to make? Or incredibly complacent? And in one sense, it's not for me to judge. Um, we must stand before God in our own conscience. And that's where Paul says that. But Paul clearly here wants the Thessalonian Christians to know that God has chosen you, verse 4. And so, in order to give them that confidence, he calls a whole series of witnesses to support his claim. The first is Paul himself. I saw how you responded to the gospel with deep conviction. That was the work of the Holy Spirit, you know, it's not normal. But secondly, he calls the witness Timothy. Timothy's just been with me, he's just reported back to me in, in, in uh, Corinth. And he's seen your, your work and your labour and your endurance. So the truth is, he knows what James' faith looks like. Hear what he says. And then the third witness that uh, Paul calls are the other churches in Macedonia and Achaia. Those are <coughs> two parts of Greece, the Roman provinces of that Greece. And they are telling Paul, who are really encouraged by these Christians in Thessalonica, they're standing up to, to persecution so bravely, their faith rings out like a bell. We are the church, ring it out, he sang. 
when the family of this day was bringing out, they were looking quiet, they were sharing their bed. And the fact was that they had turned from their idols to worship the living God. And the fourth and final witness is the Spirit Himself. How is it that you are enduring suffering with joy? It doesn't make sense. How was it that Paul and Silas and Timothy could be sitting in a, in a Roman jail in Philippi singing hymns at midnight because of the Spirit within them? And if you, Thessalonians, are still able to sing and praise God when this illness is going on, that's a witness that your faith is genuine. Your changed hearts, your changed lives, the testimony of myself and Timothy and the churches and the Spirit. Yes, God has chosen you, beloved children of God. So, the Thessalonians declare the confidence. Do you know that God has chosen and called you? Can you call God the Father? If you can, that's a sign of the Spirit working you to show that you're a Christian. Can you call Jesus Savior and Lord? Do you know that He died for your sins and that uh, that's Him where your sins going to be taken away? Can you see faith, love, and hope growing in your heart? And is it producing work and labour and endurance? Perhaps, and there are times in our lives when we do trick and stumble, we need to chat with someone, a minister or a mature Christian friend, someone who can say, yes, don't trouble yourself. You're, you're on the right path. You know that God loves you. Or it may be that you don't quite got there and you need to look a bit more closely. You need to study the scriptures and we'll hopefully be starting a nurture course perhaps in November if not in general. But if you can say with confidence, I know, not because of my goodness, not because of my intelligence, but because of God's grace, that God has chosen me, then praise the Lord and let's affect bring it as we persevere in work, labor, and endurance. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the encouragement of the scriptures. Please help us, like the Thessalonian Christians, to stand firm in faith and not grow weary. May our joy and faith ring out across the land. Amen. Well, I'm now going to sing a version of the creed that's going to lead us in at everlasting. Who stands here?
Send men into darkness, you rose in glorious light. Red of seas and high. I believe in God our Father. I believe in Christ the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection. That we will rise again, for I believe in the name of Jesus. So that, Lord God, we have sinned against you. We have done evil in your sight. We are sorry and repent. Have mercy on us according to your love. Wash away our wrongdoing and cleanse us from the blood of your Son. Amen. 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 Amen.
he broke it and gave it to them, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in the remembrance of me. We do this in the remembrance of me. His body is the bread of life. At the end of supper, taking the cup of wine, he gave you thanks and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood, which will be covered, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, we do this in remembrance of me. His blood is shed for all. As we proclaim his death and celebrate his might and his glory, send your Holy Spirit. For this bread and this wine may be to us the body and the blood of your person. As we eat and drink these holy gifts, may us one in Christ our risen. With your whole church throughout the world, we offer you this sacrifice of faith and lift our voice to join the eternal Son of Heaven, saying, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of our might. And another are full of your glory. Oh, the sun in the eyes. Every time we eat this bread and drink this wine, we pray for your Lord's death until he comes. John, here with me. Receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ that you gave for me, and his blood that you shed for me. Eat and drink in remembrance that Christ died for you, and be one in your heart. Amen. You have to come up the centre line and go down that way, leave your box in the world.
Say this prayer together as we pass. Father, we give you thanks and prayers that when we were still far off, you met us in your son and brought us back. Thy name be given, declare your love, gave us the grace, and opened the gates of glory. When we share Christ's body, live in his life, we drink his life in one night of us. We in the spirit lights in the light to the world. Keep us to the world. Keep us firm in the hope you have set before us, so we and all your children shall be free, and the whole earth live in the praise of the Lord. Christ our Lord. Amen. Let's stand and sing our final song across the winds. Stand here. Yeah. 
to love and serve the Lord, in, in the name of Christ. Christ. Amen. Amen. And please do go and have some refreshments in the marquee uh, for the last time this year.